Welcome to The Helping Conversation, an exploration and celebration of the practice, art, and science of facilitating trusting, safe, inclusive, and effective helping conversations with others. The Helping Conversation is at the core of the sacred partnership between two people when one is there to help the other. Recorded at Rock Vox Recording and Production Studios, Rochester, New York. Find your voice and broadcast it to the world at Rock Vox. Rockvox.com. And now your host of The Helping Conversation, Keith Greer. Hello, everybody, and thanks for sitting in with us again on The Helping Conversation. We have a wonderful, wonderful guest today and an exciting conversation to be had that might be a little bit of a shift for some of you in how you think about those that facilitate a helping conversation. As we've talked about on the podcast before, one of the goals is to highlight a variety of different ways that people engage in a helping conversation with their clientele, with their customers, um, with the people that they are empowered to help. And so today, we're going to take a little bit of a walk into the land of law enforcement and security. And so please join me in welcoming into the studio, Mark Henderson. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Keith. How are you? It's so good to have you here. Thanks for having me. So let me fill everybody in a little bit on, on who Mark is, because he... he uh, is presently wearing a relatively new hat in yes. his life after many, many years uh, in, in the more traditional uh, law enforcement area. So uh, Mark has uh, 34 years of law enforcement experience. He has held a variety of positions in the Brighton Police Department, which is here in the Rochester area, including sergeant, lieutenant, captain, and in July 2010, he became the chief of police. Mark has a Bachelor's of Science degree in Criminal Justice from the State University of New York in Albany, at Albany, and a Master's of Science degree in Justice Administration from the University of Phoenix. Mark has attended the FBI National Academy, Session 221 and Session 77 of the FBI Law Enforcement Executive Development Seminar. Mark currently sits on the New York State Law Enforcement Accreditation Council and is the past chair of the Monroe County Law Enforcement Council. And as of, is it a little over a year now? September, the end of September 2019 is when I retired. So, so he retired in 2019, and he now fulfills the role of Director of Community Security for the Jewish Federation of Greater Rochester. So in this role... Mark, we were just talking about this before we came on, all the hats that he now wears, includes working with congregations on security procedures and protocols, facility security assessments, and working to instill a culture of security community-wide. He is also tasked with working with locations that have security vulnerabilities by identifying funding sources, not an easy thing these mm -hmm. days, as we were just talking about, to help remediate the deficiencies. So again, Mark, thank you so much. Great, for thanks, it. great to be here. Thanks. So I always um, like to start at uh, people's beginnings because I, I am always fascinated by how so many people find themselves in careers that there were probably some indicators very early in their life that they were gonna be in that career. So maybe just start with, with just even how law enforcement became the direction that you found yourself moving in. So many people have a family business. Right. And, and they start out, whether it's a retail location or an industry, our family business was law enforcement. Oh. My uh, grandfather was a Canandaigua City police officer. Uh, my father was a New York State, uh, uh, worked in the New York State Police. He was a lieutenant, zone commander, and... Growing up, uh, you know, the role that my father had, he had a lot of interesting exposure to some things, worked some high profile uh, incidents. And uh, so I wasn't sure necessarily that I was going to go that path. Right. Uh, at the University of Albany, I had a plan of maybe going to law school. I worked in the legislature, but uh, I, you know, was home doing a visit and, uh, I uh, was offered a job in law enforcement, and 34 and a half years later, I decided, <laughs> okay, maybe it's time to, to retire. But it was a, it's been a great career. It's a great calling. My brother is in law enforcement as well. He's the elected sheriff in Ontario County. Um, okay. So it's a family business. It's family business. So besides it being the family business, if, if I had known you when you were a kid, 
were there were there signs back then above and beyond the fact that you saw family doing doing this that you were destined to do something helping others i i think that ultimately what is what led me to the profession you know um in college i thought you know maybe one it would be one path but as i had the opportunity to get into law enforcement and you know what did law enforcement mean in the 1980s um you know certainly right now there's a large discussion about law enforcement sure in, in the 1980s it wasn't as tumultuous there there was a lot of theories i studied criminal justice um university of albany had a really good program uh i, I had took a master's level class and there was a lot of uh, law enforcement leaders in the in the room right if you will from the NYPD from the state police and so I said okay I, I think that's where I'm going to go in my career uh, I'm glad I did I, I, I had a lot of uh, wonderful experiences I had a lot of stressful and uh, unfortunate uh, situations that we had to deal with in, in law enforcement but but the end result when uh, you know, I was conflicted at the end as to whether it was time to move out of that job, but right. ultimately I decided to move to a new chapter. Right. Okay. So I want to make sure I, I touch on something you just said because that it's kind of a really big interest area of mine, which is some of the the science and research that guides how we do the work that we do. But before I even get there, above and beyond, grandpa, dad, brother either as you entered law enforcement or while you've been in law enforcement, other role models, other people that really influenced how you do the work you do, up, including to today? So, uh, again, you know, there was the family, the looking up, watching my father in his role, uh, and then uh, learning more about what, you know, in later life, uh, my dad passed in 2004, and, you know, I learned about, he was part of the Attica prison retake. Whoa. And so there was a very uh, uh, interesting book that I read called Blood in the Water. Right. And so I looked at, you know, all the uh, comments that were raised in the book. And, you know, so I, I went on this journey to find out what my dad's role was. Mm. And there was a, a three-prong retaking of the, the facility. And my father uh, led a group that there was on, on the – ground was a power plant and there was a fear that the power plant was going to be used uh against the uh, guards and so you know I, I saw his role his handwritten notes and it was pretty interesting yeah. and so 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 there's that aspect uh if i were to uh talk about a mentor and a role model and a good friend it was a uh, previous brighton police chief tom vocal uh you know t all those things that you mentioned along in my career uh, Chief Vocal was the person that promoted me to those ranks, and uh, he was a, a great uh, mentor during my early days as chief. Right. And, and then when you just think you've experienced everything and there's a new thing, he'd be somebody I'd reach out to. And, yeah. you know, I think the world of Tom, and we, we still are friends to this day. That's awesome. Awesome. All right, so let's go back to, to, to models. So as you and I talked about before we, we, we came on, we want to kind of talk about this from from your role as a police officer and then heading up a department so then we're talking about not only working with the community but your own leadership within your yeah. department and now in this really big community role so i would I, I i'm probably as guilty as anyone of looking at a police officer on the street and thinking all right i trust they have some level of training and how they're going to respond and and that is based in evidence or research of here's how you interact with human beings under certain 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 situations so what are some of those guiding thoughts or or models that a, a law enforcement officer takes out onto the street so that woman or man in in the blue uniform you look at them and i and i thought you were going to say that you saw that police officer and you immediately started to sweat and you looked down and saw how fast you were going but that, well that too that yeah, too well, yeah. you know yeah. it, it, the there is it that you have the right to remain silent. You don't have to, but we're good on that. So um, that officer has training, three months in the police academy. All right. and, and, and you're learning statutes, and you're learning how to write search warrants, and you're, you're accusatory inf information, and, you know, uh, all those things that you watch your TV cop shows, and they never t really tell you about the, the mechanics behind it. Even before you go into a police academy, 
There's a very extensive hiring process, which includes a psychological screening. Okay. And you're, you're tested on a number of factors to see if you would be a, an appropriate fit for law enforcement. So once you get through all those pre-hiring tests, in the police academy, you're talked about situational awareness. You're talked about tactical preparedness, right? You're talked, you know, that you're uh, uh, in addition to the um, the basics of, of understanding the laws in New York State, and there are many and many different ways of approaching things. You have to demonstrate your profici proficiency with a firearm, and you have to understand the context in which you can use legally deadly physical force right. in situations you know that can be escalated and how police officers can play a part in that escalation, as well as how you can de-escalate a situation. Right. So in, in 1985, when I started the police academy, um, we didn't talk so much about de-escalation. We didn't talk so much about um, being able to communicate and how to deal with an uh, emotionally disturbed person, somebody that's in crisis. Right. There's not a lot of focus on that in 1985. I can tell you today there is a lot of focus on not only understanding uh, 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 a situation from an escalation, de-escalation standpoint, how to deal with somebody with crisis. There's mental health first aid. Right. In 1985, I was learned. I was taught how to put a Band-Aid on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in 2020, uh, new recruits uh, are taught um, mental health first aid, right. and in some some uh, situations, um, and I'll talk about that as as the role of chief. We adopted uh, uh, an approach. Uh, the International Association of Chiefs of Police would certify an agency on how to deal with mental, uh, those in crisis and mental health crises. And the goal was to have, you know, across the spectrum of law enforcement, everyone uh, certified in first, first mental health first aid, and then 25 to 30% having an advanced, it's called crisis intervention training. Right. Um, and uh, I, you know, I'm happy to say that I adopted that as the, the, the police chief. I had 100% um, mental health first aid uh, um, when we first rolled out the program and then uh, we, we achieved the 25 percent and it's a little bit higher now the uh, chief Cathaldi has adopted the same approach in the CIT aspect is even higher so um, for those that are, are watching or listening uh, from Brighton you have a very well-trained police agency right um, and you know, as this national discussion about policing occurs, and in particular the defunding of policing, training. There, if, if you want to train, and I believe there should be continual, ongoing training, just just like you and I have ongoing lifelong learning. Right. You know, um, you know, I can talk about change and, and how to implement change from a leader, leadership perspective, but. The police officer that you're driving by and you're thinking, okay, I'm going to get stopped for speeding. And if you do get stopped for speeding, does that officer have the tools necessary for the interaction, right? That, that Those officers are taught officer survival, right? Yeah. When you walk up to a vehicle, look for certain indicators because that traffic stop, the, the a, a domestic situations are situations where police officers are injured or killed. Right. And unfortunately, that frequency of, of injury and death to police officers is at an all-time high. Mm. So, they're, you know, the officer is trained how to approach a vehicle from a tactical perspective, key indicators to look for, how to respond if confronted with a threat. Right. Right. They're also taught how to de-escalate. They're also taught, okay, I, I know this may surprise you and the people listening. I may have been stopped for speeding in, 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 my, in my time. And it may have happened before I was on the job in my driveway with my father, who was then on the job watching the entire interaction. That wasn't a good one. Uh, but uh, um, what, uh, you know, I, I look for the cues of the officer approaching. You can tell that they're approaching from a tactical cool standpoint and you can tell how right. the conversation starts so, so as as a police chief and, and and as a police officer i knew getting into that traffic stop it, you know it, it, it was a stressful situation right. and, and as you can see i can use a little bit of humor this this morning try to do the same thing be respectful right you know again um my number one complaint as a brighton police chief dealt with traffic and the need for the Brighton Police Department to calm the traffic in their neighborhood, yeah. right? That was the number one situation. 
and then property crimes, and then uh, yeah. down down the, the the scale. So, as a police officer, I took that approach. Beautiful. And then, as a police officer, I had the opportunity to work. Uh, again, I talk about Chief Vocal and the important role that he played in my development. He created a community policing specialist position. It was bicycle bicycle based. It was in the 1990s. Got you out of a police car, yeah, onto a bicycle. And what that, that created was the ability to uh, interact. Relationship. So back in the day, community right. engagement. Right. So I rode the bike. And uh, the, the, the unintended consequence of being on a, on a bike for eight hours a day, right? <laughs> so you, you spend a little bit less time on the bike. And I, I developed some wonderful relationships, lifelong relationships. Yeah. Um, people that I, I have been invited to uh, weddings, I'd been invited to a dinner at their home. And, and that was building of community. Right. So, um, you know, that transitioned into my other roles. So when I was a first line supervisor or sergeant, you know, you have to make sure that certain things are done, but you also tried to mentor that approach of dignity, people, people yeah. treating people with respect, and then trying to build these relationships. And so as I became uh, the police chief, I took that community engagement philosophy, community philosophy, and I tried to build upon it. Yeah. And I, and yeah. I tried to watch try to create a situation where it's great to tell somebody that, hey, go out and build relationships. And sometimes people, that's not an easy thing to do. Right. So I, I would try to show, okay, a goal would be to get out of your police car, do what's called a directed uh, patrol. And, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the concern with a directed patrol. Park your car, go into a business, start engaging. Yeah. Okay. And then, so how do you quantify that or, or, or how do you capture if it's really being done? So in, in the policing world, every police car, in addition to all the tools of law enforcement, there is a computer that tells the officers where to go. It's computer aided dispatching. And then it captures what an officer does from a, a productivity perspective. Now you're going to say productivity, that's a bad word, quotas and all. No. I asked the officers to go to a location, engage in community engagement, and, and capture that to a directed patrol. Right. Worked great. And then I could quantify that. I could report to the community that out of <clears throat> 40, 50,000 calls for th service, 20, you know, 25,000, a little, little less than half, were direct officer-directed activity, which I felt built these relationships. And so... Right. As we embarked in, into the community engagement phase, you know, each time I tried to raise the bar more and more. Right. People are, is it data driven? You know, you're, there was a, a, a management philosophy in police, da data driven approach, evidence based policing. Okay. All it is is trying to take all that analytical stuff and drill it down to a person right. interaction. And what I hear you talking about, so in, in, in my world, we talk about. You know, when a, a, a client I might work with walks in, that my first responsibility in my helping role is the creation of trust, safety, and inclusion. Right. Because you get nowhere if you don't do some of that foundation Correct. work. So that getting out of the car, walking into a business, relationship building, that's money in the bank. Yes. Right? That's money in the bank. Whether, whether you can measure, right, measure it in some kind of really specific way or not, it's, it's huge. So... The, the trust and legitimacy, right? So we, the profession itself is going through a, a, a big, you know, uh, uh, I had the honor of being invited to the White House uh, uh, when President Obama presented the 21st Century Policing Report. It was right after a series of um, incidents. Uh, you know, it was a few years after the Michael Brown uh, right. And then there was a situation in Boston involving, I think it was Professor Gates, if I have his, his, his name right. And, and President Obama impaneled this commission to look at what law enforcement does and how they do it. Right. And they came out with six pillars. And the very first pillar, building trust and legitimacy. So as I sat, you know, politics aside, as I sat in the auditorium of the White House, I, you know, I, I should have had a, a, an idea. I had no idea that the president was going to attend. And the auditorium in the White House is, sounds like it's in the White House. It's in the building right next door. <laughs> so, so we're going through security. And, and it's the highest level of security. I've been to the White House 
at one previous occasion, never went to the level of security that I went through. Dog sniffing, dog, you know, repeated. And I'm like, okay. So I sit in. I had the opportunity to sit in the front row. I said, no, I'm going to sit back a little bit. So the, uh, the head of the, the cops program uh, came out and he started to talk. And large crowd, it stops. He stops. He says, we'll be right back. So I'm looking and somebody comes out from the curtain, puts the presidential seal on. And then this rather large six foot eight guy with his hands in his comes out of a doorway. And all of a sudden the president appears and he talked about, you know, steps in building trust and legitimacy. Yeah. And he talked about the need for change. And this was 2017, early 2017. It was in July of 2017. And he talked about, you know, the need to, to, to do better in law enforcement. Right. So we, we took, I, enjoyed it. We took it. Um, in uh, that time frame, we launched a, an initiative in Monroe County uh, with a faith community, Reverend Stewart, and we were able to build upon those pillars. And we, we started to sit down and we started to say, what, what, what can we do better in the Monroe County uh, area? At the time, I was the chair of the Law Enforcement Council. Um, the Law Enforcement Council um, gets its authority uh, through a leg county legislation. What, what, what it basically does is it brings all the law enforcement leaders together uh, once a month in, uh, in federal, state, all across the, the spectrum. And, and then there's a second meeting where you kind of talk about policy. So, so I was able to communicate to my colleagues at the time the importance to sit down and start a discussion and to talk about the 21st century policing report. There was a change politically. There was a change, mm -hmm. a lot of change at the time. So, you know, people uh, uh, attached a political connotation with the report. And right. I'm like, no, get past all that. Yeah. So we started to meet. Uh, with faith leaders, we started to meet with community representatives, in particular the black and brown community, and we started to have these community forums. You know, the first one was small, just some leadership trying to get past some things. We, we were able to do that uh, at the University of Rochester, a non-specific location. Okay. And then some police chiefs said, well, you know, we're going to be exploited for media purposes. Well, if we do it in a public building, media has access. If you do it on a private university, right. not so much. Right. So we, we did it. And this building of trust and legitimacy with community leaders and faith leaders, and yeah. it started to go a long way. And then we had a second. And then we had a third. And then at the third one, we had 88 representatives. Again, still at the University of Rochester, we invited the media in to talk about the work that we were doing. Beautiful. And then on the fourth one, um, we brought it to the community, and we went to um, uh, Clarissa Street. Uh, I can't recall the name of the church, and it was community based. And it was we were starting to gather people from the community to have a discussion. Yeah. So there's the, you know there's 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 a, a lot of talk right now that you know there's there's no relationships between the police and and, and communities and, and leadership. And I would beg to differ to say, take a look at our track record in 2016, right. talk to Reverend Stewart, see, see what work we've done. Right. By, by no means is the work done and the right. work continues. Right. And I think that's where, you know, just, I think sometimes in our crazy society, that's where, that's where things get broken down because people, well, well, we're not where we need to be yet. Well, no, no. but we're beyond where we were and we're just going to continue to work because this is pretty complex stuff relationship building uh, on on a on a community level so even though i have a different role now and i'm not in the public uh, vein i was invited to a meeting uh, last week in the backyard and it was a group of baptist ministers yeah black baptist ministers yeah. and they want to start a conversation and i talked about those conversations that were going on I, I talked about, you know, my role as a police chief. They had questions about train, you know, training yeah. and hiring yeah. and, you know, and then the bad cops. Yeah. Okay. Let's acknowledge that there are bad cops. Let's acknowledge okay. that no administrator would ever cover up for a bad cop. Right. I know my father wouldn't as, uh, I know, and I can certainly tell you my brother wouldn't as the right. sheriff. Right, right. And, and I had a decorum of accountability. Just you can ask staff member that I worked with. So, so as I sat with that group last week and we talked about the hiring process and we talked about the training and all these pre-employment pre, pre -employment, 
psychological screenings and physical fitness screenings. You get somebody that just deep down gets past all that and has established themselves as somebody that does not treat people with respect, right. does not acknowledge constitutional rights, and, and is a little heavy-handed or yeah. mo- is very heavy-handed. Nobody's going to advocate for keeping these people on the job. Right. In in the system, there was a, a, a in, in when we first started having these conversations, we talked about. Well, it seems that police departments protect police officers. They don't get rid of the – well, I can't – at the time, as a police chief, I couldn't really tell you about discipline. Right. Uh, and, and I've got some homework for you to do. Okay. It's, uh, it's uh, the New York State Civil Rights Act 50A. It protected a police officer's personnel file right. from public disclosure. Right. So um, one, of, uh, one of our meetings, we had a number of planning meetings. We'd have them a couple times a month. Voices would be raised. And I'd be sitting there saying, okay, I tell, you know, your, your goal is to exploit people that have a disciplinary history. Well, you couldn't at the time. So I finally just said in a raised voice, you need 50A to be changed. Well, guess what happened? It got changed, changed. this year. Yeah, right. And now they're trying to figure out how do you disclose personnel records and they're working through that right, right? and then because that's not cut and dry either no so right. you've got a whole bunch and you, and you talk about helping right is it a mistake of the mind <clears throat> or a mistake of the heart right so you got to look at the the totality of a situation if somebody's disrespectful and rude that those are barriers to building trust and legitimacy right it is also un, unbecoming and unprofessional that's right does that mean that somebody should be fired or should you put them on a course of right betterment in, 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 in coming out of that. If somebody it clearly is physical and aggressive, okay, can you fire? Well, the theory of progressive discipline, you know, you can I- I impose sanctions. And um, as a police chief, if, if you know, and, and I'll talk a little bit about some laws that have changed in that regard, I could recommend discipline that would include up to, up to and including termination, but then Individuals could get their job back through court action, right? And 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 a majority, if not ninety percent, of people that had disciplinary action could sue to get their job back. Right. Um, the court of appeals ruled in a case out of uh, Walkill, New York, which is down uh, against Orange County, yeah. down around yeah. that area. Um, they had a, a police agency that, and in, in use some of the terminology that the lawyers for the manager management of the town, rogue repeated course conduct. Right. Um, so the Court of Appeals ruled that a municipality could be the ultimate decider of police discipline. You know, the police chief would recommend, ultimately the police, uh, they would, uh, the municipality had to pass a local law. It gave the town board in the situation, uh, in Walco, the ability to remove police officers. And, uh, you know, irrespective of what the collective bargaining agreement. So you had, every collective bargaining agreement has a clause that says if the law changes or the it doesn't make the, the contract void, it just means those provisions. Right. So Walkill had a disciplinary section uh, that, that dealt with um, you know, the process binding arbitration for discipline. Well, arbitrators were keeping bad cops on the job. Court of Appeals said no, town of Walkill and any other town can create a town law that gives that ability for the town board to ultimately decide, be the decider of police discipline. Do you know what municipalities in Monroe County adopted that law? There are two. Who? I'm going to ask you to guess. Brighton? Well, that, I, I, I gave you that <laughs> softball. Uh, Webster. Town of Greece. Town of Greece. Okay. So, well, you know, you sit back and, and the city is going through this um, police accountability board. Yep. There was judicial ruling. Right. Okay. So that, 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 and again, I'm not a lawyer. I watch a lot of lawyer shows, so I think I'm qualified. The police accountability board, the, the decision out of the court of appeals for Walkill applied to town municipalities. There's another case that deal with class B cities. Right. And Schenectady was one of those class B uh, cities. And so uh, as, um, you know, the, the, the city moves to a, a, the establishment of a, a police accounti- uh, accountability board and, you know, how much, you know, under this 50A, those protections right. of documents, it right. may be different today than it was when the ruling that the judge, Judge Ark, ruled on. Right. So if we're talking in, in Brighton, it was in the town adopted this uh, law uh, 
a couple years before, it may have been the year that I left, it ultimately gives the ability for the municipality to remove <clears throat> bad cops. Beautiful. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that person that's removed from their job still has due process rights. Of course. And, and can sue to say right, that it right, was right. you know retaliatory, Wrong, right, whatever, right. whatever. But so so that's that's different today in twenty twenty than it was in nineteen eighty five. But you know, in, in embracing some of the, um, if not all of the, twenty uh, uh, um, first century policing talked about the increase of technology. Right. This is countrywide. There's parts of the country that don't use computer driven or data driven or evidence based policing approaches. They just go out and enforce the law as they right. see it. Right. And and you know, there's you know a focus on officer well being too. So I was just going to ask you about that because that's that's where I go. Right. In in, and, and again, I know as someone who trains coaches and clinicians, we talk about this all the time of, of the impact of vicarious trauma of sitting in our office every day working with clientele who are sharing trauma, loss, grief, you know, all of this, and the impact on us as helping people. It seems to be like to, in my head would be a whole nother level for a police officer who is out in the community. On one hand, they're doing all of that wonderful relationship building, which is great, but they're also dealing with a lot of trauma right. and, and chaos and the impact on them. So I'm curious, maybe even just really quick, any, any training, yes. any guidance so, that so, officers get just so around that. So you hit, you hit right on it. Nobody calls the police to say that their son or daughter got straight A's, <laughs> right? So they're usually called to a situation when it's hot. And yeah. once they get all that calmed down, okay, then, you know, the, it's personality. Let's take the call of the car accident. Right. And the officer's right around the corner. Right. And, and there's a, a dead teenager. Mm. Okay. There's that aspect of right. it. Right. Right. And then there's the aspect of going and telling the family as Right. Okay. Yes, that wears on the police officers as it does the the emergency medical personnel. Yeah, uh, right. And the firefighters. Right. Just, All first responders. Right. right. And then, so what's different today is you identify the need for crisis intervention for staff. Okay. Right. So we uh, we have a we 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 had a policy uh, that would say any situation that rose to a certain level, you would automatically bring in a, a, an intervention team. And whether it was employee assistance, which makes it confidential. Right. Okay. This may surprise you. Cops don't trust a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, the, you know, the first thing you would do, you would have this horrendous situation. And then as a, uh, well, I'll talk about it when it happened to me as a police officer. You know, so I went to a situation that you never want to go to. And the first thing I said is I'm fine. Mm. We all sat around, and it was a pretty heinous crime. It was a very violent crime. It was a very young individual that it happened to. So the team all got together, and I was not senior management at the time, and they're all talking about the necessary steps for they have to do, they have to do, and they have to do. And it occurred during the overnight hours, and I, I, I debriefed, and I said, okay, I need to go home. Yeah. I couldn't sleep. Mm. So, and I also knew at the time I needed to talk to somebody. Yeah. So, you know, I went invoked the EAP process, met off-site. It was very cathartic getting it off my chest and, and trying to understand, you know, I had no control or whatever. Yeah. So so what's different now, we don't necessarily leave it to the individual yeah. to say that you need help, right? Okay, you get involved in something? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gently guide you that this resource is there. Right. Well, no, I don't need that resource, okay? I'm going to mandate <laughs> you're going to go have that interaction. Right. And, and the only report I'm going to get is that an employee utilized that service. Right, right. Okay? I'll feel better about it. Yep. You'll feel better about it. Yeah. And if you want, I can share you with it my, my experience, right? Right. So, so there's that. <clears throat> and then if during that process an officer divulges something that, that, that triggers a uh, Hey, that might be, you. You might need a threat. Well, associated with the officer's job is a firearm, right? So, so there's that you know that shield of silence. If I say the wrong thing, right, right, right. right. So, and then you take a look at the last five years of officer suicides, mm -hmm. and you try to drill down to why that is. 
Is it is it because officers are not truly being uh, forthright in in their sessions because they don't want to lose their firearm, their fire access to their firearm, their firearm is their job. Right, right. And, and are there mental health? So there are some procedures now that that are uh, peer groups, right? Police peer groups. So they're talking police officer to police officer. There's you know um, some very progressive, forward-thinking leaders out there that are, are looking at this national trend of uh, law enforcement suicide, right. saying, why is this? What can we do? And along with the mental health first aid we use for our job, there's mental health first aid for law enforcement and all first responders. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I sit here sometimes, at, you know, and you've referenced, referenced the, the complexity of the conversation we're presently in in our society yeah. about law enforcement. And I do find myself thinking sometimes, especially as you talk about something like officer suicide, have we maybe, right, without getting political about this, have we maybe over time asked law enforcement to do more than they need to as funding for other kinds of more, you know, social community supports have gone away? Right, that, that we have put so much on the plate. Not, not only do you show up and you need to think tactically and you need to think like a police officer, but you th need to think like a social worker. You need to walk into this, you just described what you experienced, and we know the impact on us as human beings when we, when we look at trauma. And you're supposed to respond to it and then you're supposed to be calm and it just seems like an awful lot to ask a human being to fulfill some pretty disparate roles at the at the same time. Remember what you were doing when you were 21? Not a whole lot. Okay. So we're asking our 21-year-olds because that's currently right now the group that are being hired, 21 right. to 25, right? Yeah. We, there's been a large retirement, and I don't want to use the term exodus because that will be perceived in political right. context. right. right. There have been a, 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 there was a large hiring uh, block in the 1980s. Those are people who are all retiring out, and then there's a new a new cycle coming in. So that 21 to 25 year old graduates college, goes through a police academy, a three month police academy, goes through a field training period where they have to show and demonstrate that they can do the job. Right. They're in their own police car for the first time. They're being asked to calm traffic in the neighborhood. They're in, they're in, in a, you know, certain other locations, not necessarily as much in Brighton. They're asked to deal with loitering and hand-to-hand -hand drug, all these things. Yep. And then they get a call for service of a month. You know, let's, let's say it involves a, an emotionally disturbed person. And I can talk about a period that I studied about institutionalization for those from a mental health per perspective right then the, the the wave of deinstitutionalization and the closing of facilities and, and and nowhere for individuals to go that were yeah. in crisis and where do they go they go to the street yeah and and now that 25 year old that is still trained to mature with all these tools <laughs> is being asked to handle a situation a person in crisis and we give them that training right but at the same time doctors People that have spent a long time can't yeah, necessarily deal. And, right. and it's the cops are being asked to. Right? That's right. Um, um, uh, cops are being called into family situations because somebody's not doing their homework. Right. So that puts the law enforcement officer in a negative vein to the young person because right. they're associated with a negative interaction. Yeah. And, and, and so, yes, as we look at this larger conversation of we'll defund and take away from law enforcement and we'll give to social service programs. That's great. Monroe County, there is a team of uh, mental health specialists right. that it was growing in response. And, and Monroe County is at the forefront. I think that's great. Let's fund that more in yes. conjunction with law enforcement, right? Let's, you know, today's news, 20% reduction in the Rochester City School District. How do you do with that? How do you how do you deal with that from a teaching standpoint? Know, right? How do you do all all those things? So, if you take twenty percent away from law enforcement and give it to the school district, right? These are the in, in today's right. th these are the officers that are being called to to quell an unusually fifty percent increase in homicides right. and shootings in in the number of of violent encounters, right? Our new office in the Federation is in a real quiet section of East Avenue. There was a running gun battle 
driving right. gun battle. Right. Uh, the the Down business are yeah yeah. So so you know you, you you look at is is the time right to do that? Yeah. I mean, you know. So I I can tell you that I started in law enforcement. I studied the what occurred in the seventies and the uh, very high crime rates. And then different programs, right. broken windows, whatever, uh, zero based, uh, you know, zero tolerance based programs, and what impact that had. I, I remember still driving into New York City in the squeegee, right? right. That's how old I am. <laughs> um, and then going to New York City and saying, there's really no, but now it's a little different. And maybe yeah. that's going back. And the, the officers are being asked to deal with homeless and they're encampments. Well, it's, they're not encampments. They're homeless areas that people feel comfortable. Right. And, you know, the officers are going in and being asked to clean it, clear it out. And well, where do these people go? Yeah. Look, I know the other area, because this is near and dear to my, my, my heart and my work, is, is just, again, the, the ongoing issue with the opioid epidemic and overdose and showing up and and you know being a first responder when when someone has overdosed and then and then i know my field sometimes is guilty of saying to police officers well you need to not only show up but now you need to kind of start the treatment process correct right so even there that that model you talked about of of maybe mental health people coming with them right. so we're in a better position today to understand the opioid crisis right. and we're in a, in a better position today tracking trying to right. find it find the sources, criminalize the conduct, not so much of the use, right. but the seller. The seller. Well, that was a foreign concept to me, and that was a role that was changing in my role as chief. Right. And, you know, our little suburban community was not immune. Nope, none are. Okay. So I went to a call that involved an overdose dose death of an individual, not too far from the temple that you're associated yeah. with. And I sat there, and, and it was an 11-year-old boy that was in crisis. Mm. He, and he convinced his father to allow his mother back into the home. The mom had been living on the street involved yeah, in yeah. and uh, tried, you know, tried very hard to – this young boy tried very hard to get his mom on a path of right. sobriety. Right. And, you know, they had been – she had been in the home for a few days, and next day the young boy wakes up to find his mother deceased. <laughs> so So – you look at what what can we do so right. a couple of things that came out of that that particular case we we involved and we invoked uh, our drug task force there's a yep. county one they started to look where the drug came from right who the seller was okay um the young young man a young young boy uh we had a big guilt mm. couldn't save mom we we we, inter, we involved mental health at the yeah. time yeah dad had a lot of attitude I had to bring in my father role and say, maybe now is not necessarily the time. Yeah. And I get that you, you know, the, the dynamics yeah, of the family, yeah, such, yeah. all these things that cops are being asked to do. That's with. right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, so what's different today is that particular case. We were able to trace, we, <clears throat> the investigators were able to trace back <clears throat> not only where the source, where the drug came from, it was a delivery where the mid-level supplier was. Right. So some good came out of that. And now there's recovery. Recovery is not a bad word. Right. Yeah. There are situations where police officers can bring people in crisis. Yeah. There are drop-in centers. Yep. Yeah. Open access. And, right. Keys to recovery right. and right. Right. Yeah. all these yeah. things. <clears throat> things that we never, in 1985, I mean, you affiliated, the heroin use in 1985 was going down, but you associated in 1985 heroin, heroin use as being a bad thing. Right. Well, that continued on, and then now, and, and there's a number of reasons that you look at why the proliferation of heroin abuse and fentanyl, it's the opioid crisis, yeah, right. created by, oxy's not going to hurt anybody. Yeah, that's it's, right. You know, and, and you, know, you got pains, yeah. and th then you had an addicted society yeah. that all of a sudden that was taken away. Right. So, yeah, we, 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 we talk about those approaches. You talk about it. It can't be strictly... You're not going to be able to arrest your way out of the situation. Yeah, not that one. No. Right. And, but that's different today. Right. So I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the clock because we are going to run out of time. You know I talk too much. Right, right, right. We just do. So I really wanted, I want to jump forward to your present position with the Federation. And what I'm interested in is, right, so, so to me there's, there's a level of helping skill like in your work as a police officer in the community. And then there's a level of helping skill as – 
the head of an organization who helps the organization grow to help the people in the community. So in this role with the Federation, and maybe even just as much so in your role as police chief, you are now within a larger system helping the system move forward. So, so what are some of the helping skills you bring to that? So as the police chief, when <clears throat> he raised my hand, said it was a career ambition, lifelong goal. Right. And then 24 hours into the position, a series of events started happening, and I'm like, what did I get myself into? <laughs> so, so after you get your, your feet under on that, then you look at, I, I try to consider, I consider myself to be a global thinker right. from the 30,000 feet. And where are we going to be not just tomorrow, today, tomorrow, where are we going to be six months, where are we going to be a year, where are we going to be a year and a half from okay. now? And, and some of those schools that you mentioned that I attend, the National Academy, the best – uh, by far, uh, opportunity to to learn leadership skills, and it's a, a baseline for leadership. It was actually started by J. Edgar Hoover way back in the day to try to professionalize local law enforcement. Right. My claim to fame in that you you go to the FBI Academy for three months, and you you're usually in a leadership role, and it reacquaints you with getting back into your studies. The, the classes are put on by the University of Virginia, and it's all college level. You can either take it at the bachelor's or master's. So everybody takes it very serious, and and there's an opportunity of failure. And there's an op opportunity for shame. So you, you take it very serious. But you also meet a lot of interesting people. The person across the hall uh, from where, I, where my dorm was was the lead investigator on the Princess Diana car crash from Paris. Wow. And after I could understand what he was saying, we talked about <laughs> that, right? And then uh, my, my suite, we, had a, we shared a common suite. Uh, well, suite mate was uh, the Filipino now the number two in the Filipino Police Department. Right. And my roommate was a, a, a Toronto a superintendent. So you, you're amongst other people, and you, you try to figure out what works for you, right. what worked for them, and then you know you, you come on this lifelong learning path. So as the chief, you know, I, I, I community engagement was one of my themes. I tried to introduce different things to policing, body cameras, things that would help and assist offer a degree of accountability, provided training opportunities, provided would go and ask for the funding for it. So I, I, you know, when I was leaving a year, I think we can all remember what we were doing that Saturday when we heard of a shooting in Pittsburgh. Yeah, right. I'm not Jewish, but I've worked in a community that's predominantly Jewish, and I worked in a, a community uh, since 1986, and I've got great relationships. I have a, a, a number of friends at the rabbi level and, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, and, and I'll talk about my new role and it's a, it's a much larger community uh, and the dynamics to the community. So uh, as the police chief, I get a call that there's a shooting that's a, um, a situation in um, Pittsburgh that's evolving, I was getting updates. I was getting uh, contacted from the state police, you know, because the focus was on Brighton and Mm -hmm. Could you know? Could there be copycats? Could there be? So we instant uh, immediately implemented patrols to locations in Brighton. We uh, started to monitor. You know, there's uh, uh, some intelligence sources that were providing stuff and who the shooter was and his background. And then I heard from the Federation. You know, Mark, you aware of this? Yeah. Well, Chief, yes, I am aware of it. I will brief you as it goes on, and then. For those that are listening, and I think you say watching because it's going to be. Yeah. Saturday is the Sabbath. Some people use communication devices on the Shabbat. Right. There's a large part of the community that do not. Right. So um, tried to communicate to individuals. Some, yeah, I could pick up a phone and say this is what we're doing. Other other rabbis that might, were part of my network were not picking up the phone. Right. So we had to get a message to them. And then throw in, uh, I think I mentioned my brother was the elected sheriff, and I was holding a fundraiser that time at my house. <laughs> so all the everything came together at once, but we agreed that we would all meet together on Sunday, Sunday morning right. at the Federation. Yeah. So I walked in. I, I had representatives reached out to the sheriff. He sent a representative, the RPD, the state police. And in, in the Federation office sat 50 people all concerned about safety moving forward. What you know, and, and it was palpable. And, and these were people that I dealt with. You know, our, 
uh, are across the community and they're looking to me for what are you going to do to provide and and oh by the way we were also planning for what we thought to be a tour of 300 person community gathering show of support for the the victims and the survivors right so that day so I, I connected to the community closer that day than I ever had so went back to my office met with the patrol staff said oh oh this Temple Birth Codish is going to host a little bit of a gathering tonight, and we'll do this, we'll do that. I didn't call in any additional resources. I put some other agencies on notice. That two and three hundred person, if you promise not to tell anybody, it's just shy of four thousand people. I know, yeah, right. and, 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 and the fire marshal may not have been, uh, you know, the supervisor and I agreed that we weren't really going to specifically count, but. As that developed and the crowds just kept coming and it was a cross-cultural, cross-denominational, everything, you know, face, everything came together that night. And Brighton literally gridlocked. I kept calling for additional resources. So from that day on, I started to do some outreach. I went to the Hillel Day uh, Community Day School on Monday to talk to the students. You know, I, I dealt with leadership just the board of directors at the JCC. So what's different came out to Temple Sinai right. and said, okay, now we're going to have to start looking things a little bit differently, right? You don't have to necessarily think that you have to be in a sanctuary participating in your faith, but have to look over your shoulder. There has to be a way f- for people to feel comfortable and safe when they go to a synagogue or a shul. So uh, at the time, the Federation uh contracted with a group called Secure Community Network, yep. and at one time was known as SCAN. There was a word alert in there, it's now changed. And so they were, uh, SCN came out and did some site assessments. They had some former Homeland Security uh, professionals that are now in the private sector. They, they, they worked on that. Uh, the president of the Federation at the time, I was at a social event, she, uh, came up to me and said, you know, we're, we're thinking about, and it was a recommendation of SCN, uh, of, of hiring a secu- community security director. Would you support that as a police chief? Absolutely. How can I help? You know, I, right. you know I've been out and I've talked about armed versus unarmed security, talked about a whole bunch of things. And I said, do you want a letter? Do you want, you know, she said, no, if, if, if it's okay to quote you. So... They were looking at an individual, and the job was posted. They they did some interview, and time went on, and I, I attended a meeting at the Federation building, and they're like, is this something that you'd be interested in? And the timing was right. Yeah. The cause was right. Yeah. And so I took this job, and I started to look at the Jewish community in the greater Rochester area. I dealt with a municipality of 16 point some odd miles, 36,000 people at night, 100,000 during the day. And now I'm looking at the footprint of locations I had never even heard of, <laughs> right? Mikva, all these <laughs> other. Uh, right, right? Right? So, so I learned, I, I learned uh, you know, uh, uh, of different uh, uh, congregations outside the town of Brighton, the footprint, the, the geogra- geographic footprint of the, the greater, the Federation of Greater, Jewish Federation of Greater Rochester, goes down into Ontario County, goes into Livingston yep. County. And, and so I learned about that, and there was some talk in, in an interview that I would also be affiliated with Syracuse and Ro- uh, Buffalo, make it a regional approach. Right. That has not developed, and I don't think that's going to develop. So, so as I, I embarked on this journey of transition from the public sector, where if I wanted a program, the body cam program, right. $187,000 implication, we had money. All you had to do was raise taxes. Right. So I come to Temple Sinai, yeah. and you were coming on as the president, yeah. and I was still the police chief, bringing in the new police chief, trying to say, well, I'm going to promise you the world. Right? <laughs> and so I get in this role, and there, there was a very ambitious goal of fundraising. Right. Right? And, and, but it hadn't been achieved yet. So I'm like, well, what, I'm going to go to a location, and I'm going to see some immediate – vulnerabilities and then I'm not gonna be able to sleep at night yeah so the Farish Foundation very great asset to, to yeah. the right not just to drop just a Jewish community the community is a, a whole and no I question. remember Max Farish back yeah. in the day and his horses yeah 
So the Farish gave some seed money. They gave some opportunity. You know, they, they donated to a campaign. For those that are watching, it's called Rock Strong. And we, we are um, very ambitiously fundraising. Our yeah. goal is to raise an immediate $3 million and then uh, over a period of time, $10 million so that this can be an endowed position. Right. And it can be uh, not only just the salary of, of the security director, but the opportunity to provide for additional right. resources moving right. forward. So with the seed money, I went to a location. We looked at the vulnerabilities identified in the report. Chabad, a community-based Hasidic way of providing the ability for anybody to come in and participate in, in services. And we had, I, had a, I never knew of a, a location at the University of Rochester. And I went there, and in their, in their assessment, they talked about the concern of two doors. Right. I looked at two store, those two doors. Well, they got an estimate for $18,000 to replace the two doors. Well, part of my role was to find a vendor. Yep. We did. We didn't pay eighteen thousand right. dollars. We paid considerably less. Yeah. And we got it done within a week. Right. And then I went to another location that had a vulnerability. And then I went to another location that had a vulnerability. So and initially at to date we've uh, put out a hundred and twelve thousand dollars in immediate projects. Yes. And now the goal is to address the larger projects. Right. And that's so so COVID hits. I told you before we, we started talking that I learned a new term, pivot. And, and maybe all, you know, everyone that's, that's listening understands pivot very well, okay? I, I, law enforcement, we didn't pivot quickly, right. and we had planning, and we had, okay. So now I, I transitioned from the security director that, that dealt with discussion of armed guards, discussion of uh, pr uh, practices. I was also going to teach one of the things that came out of Pittsburgh. They, uh, they had a, a community, a regional community director that was F, former FBI that taught this fighting back, run, hide, fight, and it's gone through a whole right. bunch of evolutions of, 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 of terminology. And so I was going to teach that to the community. I'd done my first did it with our board at the Federation, and then I was going to be community-based. I, I still am going to be community-based when we get back to normal, and then everything locks down. So my role now is not only to provide, now that we're back up and running to a certain extent, but also to transition from a health and safety perspective. Right. There's aspects of the Jewish community that believe you have to have in-person services, yeah. minions, yeah. learn that word, yeah. uh, a desire for larger in-person services right so we pivoted if you will into looking at what that has from a security aspect from a health and safety aspect dr mendoza the health direct director was really good to address the community uh, the one, once the governor gave the go ahead you know it started with 10 people then of course it went to 25 right. people and now it's a percentage of your so so we're working through those and then we're also working with a you know Access control is one of the things that we advocated for, and we did it with your tool. Right. Armed guards to control the access. Yep. And now there are, there are um, aspects of the community that want to have outside services under tents. No access control. Right. No over, you know. So, so the conversation I had yesterday to a, a group of rabbis is, okay, you put up a large tent in a parking lot, that brings unique security right. concerns. So we started to talk about those security concerns. And the Federation, outside of the Rock Strong campaign, <clears throat> has a uh, armed guard reimbursement fund. Right. I know your your yep. show was a beneficiary yep. last year. Last year. So we're so as I talk to this one approach, the only way to truly completely provide Overwatch and security is have redundancy, multiple officers. Well. In the conversation with the rabbi, I had one last year. Well, we're going to look at that differently this yeah. year. We're going to look at a larger footprint. And, you know, and the good news, and I used to use this terminology in my previous role, it's going to be budget neutral to your yeah, operating yeah. budget. Well, listen, what I can tell you as somebody who uh, is a member of the Jewish community and, uh, and active in the leadership within my synagogue is I, I think we're all still looking at each other and, and, and thinking it seems like five minutes ago we didn't even have to have this conversation. This conversation about security 
was not on our radar, yeah. right? Until Pittsburgh happened. Yes. And now all of a sudden it is, and it's real, and this is COVID to the side. Right. Um, and, and so I can say, and I, I'm very confident, I'm speaking for the larger Jewish community, thank you to thank you, you, to Meredith, to the Federation. And, and it, there's several levels of that thank you. There, there's, the, there's the guidance and the expertise of how to even start this conversation, where to even look, how to assess our buildings. There's the financial implication, because like faith communities of all different types of faiths, there isn't a whole lot of money in the budget when, yes. when you start talking about yeah. thousands of dollars of upgrades for security at your building. So all of that fundraising that that you guys are doing, it, it's so appreciated. It's just wonderful leadership for, for, again, for a topic that two days ago we just weren't even needing to talk about. And now now we have to. Yeah. In, in, so when I was contemplating a career change, I had done it one time earlier actually announced that I was leaving. I had a rabbi reach out to me and said, you really want to leave? You know, we feel so comfortable with you. Uh -huh. And I'm like, okay. And then I was having second thoughts. It was the timing right? I was going to leave for a private sector university job. I just, so in the long run, I ended up staying. The JCC got a series of bomb threats yeah. and I kept hearing over again and over again, how important, my role and what I meant to the Jewish community. And I'm like, okay, I'm in the right job. I did the right thing. I'm 57. I got a couple more years I want to work. And then this, this job, this opportunity became available. So uh, I'm in an interview and I'm talking with a community leader. Um, and I made, it made the comment, you know, I, I want to work about six more years. And I said, you know, if I do such a good job, I'm gonna, am I going to put myself out of work? <laughs> and this this strong community leader looked at me and said, you know how long anti-Semitism has been? Yeah, right. been around? Yeah, it ain't going away anytime soon. It's not going away anytime soon. And unfortunately, and when, this, when, when I was hired, we did not experience the levels of anti-Semitism that we're experiencing yeah, today, right. even with the measures in place. Right. And so later today, I'm meeting with a community member, to, and we were going to discuss the overall Rochester problem. Right. There was a swastika in my tenure as police chief that was burned into the roadway with gasoline yep. in front of a Holocaust survivor yeah. by young people. Yeah. And the reaction that the community, that neighborhood was, and the reaction, we arrested those two young people for, for felony level crimes. Ultimately, restorative justice came in. Right, I remember right? that. Yeah. And the, the whole process of that, but that was still a very, you know, the road had to be milled. And then um, my, my final year as chief, we, we had a series of flyers in Temple Sinai was one of the areas that it occurred at of this what appeared to be benign organization called Identity Europa. Do a little bit of research onto it. It's, it's a, a, a group that was affiliated with white supremacy. Yep. They were affiliated with the alt-right Charlottesville yep. rallies, yep. hate rallies. Yep. And did to dig a little deeper, and the ultimate goal of this organization was to get political, politically involved and have the overthrow of the government. Yeah. So the way we reacted to that was we just didn't discount it. We just didn't say they're going to be flyers. And we took an approach, and, and thanks to the work of a very good police officer, he found a technique to develop fingerprints in a, in a tape, wow. and we identified the person. It was attending one of our large universities, right. a month away from becoming a commissioned officer in the United States Army. Wow. Okay? So at the time, we tried to engage. Yeah. Didn't get very far. Yeah. There was a statute that was around since the 1930s. It goes back to the police academy days when you look at statutes, right? They talked about affixing advertisements to public structures. Yeah. Well, we invoked that statute it created a national response google my name you'll see tv discussions in my picture in san francisco and i was never uh the gentleman was from the dc area the dc area picked up on it pretty heavy yeah. and ultimately what happened was the town decided that as long as this young person this person stayed out of trouble 
the charges would be dismissed. It's called the contemplation and dismissal. Dismissed. So, but the way that it was portrayed in the media is Brighton backed off of it. Brighton and back off of it. And our intent was never to put, you know, find anybody. It was to put an end right. to, to, to this blanketing of flyers in Brighton and Pittsford. Right. And so uh, as a result of that, um, again, in a Google search, I have been labeled as anti-white. Mm-hmm. And a series of threats were, mm. uh, I you know, commented about me on this particular website, and I reached out to the FBI, and they're like, "Hey, it's something to be concerned about." Yeah. So when I meet with people and not being Jewish, you don't know what it's like. Right. Well, here, let me show you. Yeah, right, right, <laughs> right. Sure. Right. Hate is hate. Hate is hate. Hate is hate. And so that just empowered me. Yeah. Good. And so I am no longer feeling that. Yeah, you know, again, once a cop, always a cop. And with the current discussion going, I think we can do a better job of the dialogue. Right, right. And you know, getting back to my family business, if you will, I, I miss it, but I think I'm in the right place, yeah. and I think I have purpose in my role. Beautiful. And 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 you know, as far as helping, I mentioned you know, last minute pivot I had to make so that I could be at a specific location to make sure everyone was safe. Um, later today, I'll be talking to uh, other services that are looking for a mix of things and working with them to get through the high holiday. This is when I, it was a year ago. I think the high holidays were the end of September, yeah, beginning of right. October. It's a little earlier this year. So it'll be a year on the job. I like where we are from a fundraising standpoint. I like the engagement that's happening in the community. And I think I'm getting a better understanding of uh, uh, one of the rabbis gave me a book that thick and says here's the first five thousand years of judaism <laughs> Learn he goes, I'll, I'll help you get on the i said you just gotta help me on yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. and everybody everybody laughs when i try to pronounce words and i'm like okay <laughs> that's just all right like, well listen mark henderson thank you thank, thank you, you for kid. for being here today thank you for your 30 plus years in law enforcement and bringing what clearly you know what i'm hearing today um, is is a focus from the beginning on, on relationship building yes. and, and on connecting as human beings and now bringing all of that specifically to, to a, a piece of the community that I live in and that um, and we just so we, we so appreciate, I appreciate all that, that you were doing Thank and, you. and um, this was not enough time so somewhere we're going to do part two Perfect. Right, where we'll get and, back and, together and do part two and, and see where things are at. I, I'm honored that you had me here today. Well, thank, well, you. thank you so much. Okay. So that's it for us for today. Um, a big thank you to my guest, Mark Henderson. Uh, and uh, I hope this was, was thought-provoking and, again, maybe a different way to think about those that do helping conversations besides some of us more traditional helping people. I appreciate you sitting in with us uh, today, and uh, I look forward to uh, to the next episode where we will continue um, the exploration and celebration of the practice, art, and science of the helping conversation. Have a great day. We thank you for sitting in on our discussion today on just one unique version of the helping conversation. We would love to hear your thoughts on today's podcast, so we sincerely invite you to follow, rate, and most importantly, review our episodes. Please join us for our next episode as we continue the exploration and celebration of the practice, art, and science of the helping conversation.